Yeah. So I don't, I don't really listen to podcasts. Sorry, I don't really listen to podcasts in prison. I couldn't really do so. So I was just sort of like, you know, I, I'm starting to. I'm listening to uh, Antonio's podcast, uh, the guy who wrote Chaos Monkeys. Um, it's pretty tedious. There's a lot of podcasts. So like to me, I, I like published research. I like, you know, code. I like, you know, things that are like, you know, just takes on stuff seems to me like too flimsy. Like, oh, you know, this is how I think about, you know, this or that. It's like, cool. Like, you know, do I really care? Like, what difference does it make? You know, to me, something more immutable, something more formidable, like a new protocol, a new code base, a new app, uh, you know, um, something like that is more exciting. Um, you know, it's hard to sort of get too excited about like, somebody's opinion about the news or like somebody's opinion about somebody's opinion about somebody's opinion. That to me is like a colossal waste of time. One of the things I thought about in jail a lot was like the rise of Netflix and Disney plus and like all this content that Americans, not just Americans, but the whole world. Um, but I think to some extent, Americans uh, through our prosperity, we seem to have this like unending desire to consume content. We're consuming some right now, as a matter of fact, but like, you know, you could be reading a book, you could be growing your skills, you could be, doing whatever. Now it's a Friday night, so we should all be um, forgiven. But, you know, I don't understand, quite frankly, the person that watches Netflix seven days a week. I don't understand the person that listens to 50 podcasts. Like, that's just not me. Like, I'm a workaholic. Um, you know, it's sort of like uh, all, all work and no fun, but, you know, makes somebody a dull, dull person. But at the same time, like, that's just the way I'm wired. So, like, podcasts are never going to be my um, jam unless it's like a really, a podcast that's really talking about really interesting things like quanta has a podcast that's pretty good um but even then i feel a little guilty like listening to two guys who are really smart talk about quantum mechanics because i'm like well you know could i be using this time more more efficiently and that's all we've got right is we've got time and we have to convert it into some usable resource and you know if we do that improperly we'll be homeless and if we do it properly we'll have all the resources we want. We can't look at the world so mechanically and coldly and economically, of course. We all want to have fun and do things that are more meaningful than just converting our time resources into productivity. I sound like a machine. Um, but, you know, it matters because, you know, depending on your other resources, you could spend time with your brother or sister or mother or father or what have you, um, you know, whenever you want, possibly, or whatever. I think it's important not to get, like, so sucked into the rat race that you don't have any fun and you don't have any meaning in your life. But at the same time, like if you're going to work and you're going to try to succeed, like you might as well try to do it um, as hard as you can and then sort of take your free time and still have that meaning and purpose. So for me, I, podcasts seem mostly to be a waste of like hearing other people's opinions and other people's convictions that are probably pretty interesting entertainment, but not, you know, going to actually make me a better person or a healthier person or a smarter person or a more productive person. So let's go with Vishal. And if hey. you guys, if you've had your question answered, if you don't mind stepping down so I can let some other people up, that'd be good. Um, by the way, uh, Jordy, just coincidentally, I sent you uh, cold DMs recently. I don't think you got to it, so if you could check that. Um, just sure. speaking of uh, going hard all the time and being a workaholic. <laughs> will do, will do. Hey, Martin, hope you're doing well. You know, thinking back to 2016, 2017, when you would stream your due diligence process on on biotech names, like, would you say nowadays that investing in biotechs is more crowded, maybe more efficient, and there are less value arbitrage opportunities? Or do you think that the process of finding alpha and the ecosystem of opportunities is not that different than maybe, you know, five years ago, 10 years ago? Like, is it still viable to find a viral therapeutics or an axokine from a genome, or is it just more difficult nowadays? Oh, wow. You went really way back for the axokine. No, I, I mean, I think there's still opportunities. Um, like the recent one was Cortexime, uh, and there was a handful of other ones. That wasn't that recent, obviously, but Cortexime was like a pretty obvious short um, that I think short sellers made some money. And I think that actually you've seen a lot of biotech hedge funds kind of struggle. Um, I think that's putting it mildly. Um, and a lot of those guys are my friends, so I wish they make all the money in the world. Don't get me wrong. But I think that like there aren't as many short sellers as they were before. So when I was doing this professionally, what I found was they were like, I could talk about one of them since they're no longer in business, but one of the biggest short sellers was Visium, um, which was a fund that came from Baliazny, which was a very big hedge fund. And um, Visium was quite good. They, they were sort of unfortunately ripped apart by an insider trading scandal, uh, which ended up in a very, very sad situation where one of the partners actually committed suicide. Um, 
And uh, it was a very big hedge fund. They shorted a lot. And I noticed when they left the market that shorting got a little easier and our options arbitrage got a little easier, which they were like very good at. So I think it depends on the state of the market participants to some extent. I think everybody has the same IQ. Like when you see a vital therapeutics, it's a pretty obvious short. Um, but the question is, are there 10 other funds, you know, competing with you to short vital therapeutics? If so, you're not going to have a great time relative to if there's only one. And it works the same way with value investing. If you have a lot of capital and everybody else has bom been bombed to bits, they're down 30 percent or they're down 50 percent. Well, investing is really easy if you have fresh capital or permanent capital or whatever. So I think, you know, right now you have a pretty you have a market in pretty big disarray. So usually the best opportunities are when things are in pretty big disarray. And I do think that's where we're at. Um, whether there's some really great longs or really great shorts, you're going to have to, at least from my perspective, at least wait and see a little bit. I have to get sort of reacclimated to the market, but I will be talking about biotech stocks um, and I will be finding some good shorts and shorting them, doing stuff like that. So we'll sort of see um, how that happens and where that unfolds. I don't know if I'll do a sub stack or, or what, but you know, I'll, I'll, I'll be talking about drug stocks from here to eternity. Um, I think that there have been times where, where, Equities seems seemed quite arbitrage. And I think people, when they invest, have to think pretty hard about kind of this arbitrage coefficient or alpha coefficient and correlation. So obviously, we all know we watch correlation coefficients, right? And the question is, you know, in certain markets, correlation coefficients sort of go to one, right? Like Bitcoin becomes correlated, biotech stocks become correlated, they all become correlated. But that doesn't necessarily mean they, they don't become arbitrageable. So I think alpha is kind of its own variable. It's not the inverse of beta necessarily. So to me, like sometimes there's, like I said, with enough participants that are well capitalized and like in good stead. And by the way, you know, there are plenty with Citadel, with Millennium, with kind of these market neutral mega kind of pod shops, um, 0.72 um, and others, you know, there are stable market participants out there to keep the markets from going too crazy. So I think that you you know, you have to sort of look at arbitrage in your own portfolio. And if you look at it and you say, gee, I can't find that many longs, I can't find that many shorts. Well, listen, stay in cash and do private equity. I think the problem with that modality is a lot of people can't do lots of asset classes, which is probably a good thing. But there's nothing wrong with like Balpost, Seth Klarman, who's probably one of the best investors in the world. Listen, if you can't find great, thick arbitrage opportunities, just relax, you know, find, just keep looking and you'll find eventually you'll find them again. And if the worst case scenario is you're staying in cash and you're kind of don't feel like you're doing much, then, you know, you have to get used to that feeling because it's like one of the healthiest feelings you can have as an investor is to just say no, you know, like, no, I'm not going to risk a 10% position to make 10%. Um, so I make 1% in the end. If I'm wrong, I'm going to lose 10%. That risk reward doesn't make sense. So I think there's so many kind of so much for patience and it's really difficult for me. It was really hard to do as a, as a hedge fund guy, I did so much, so much better when I didn't have investors. Um, when I had investors, it was really tough because you feel like you have to perform for them. But when you don't have investors, you can like take the day off and go to the park. Like you don't have to force yourself to trade and force yourself to, to make mistakes. So I hope that's a little helpful and I will be back talking about stocks. So uh, secret maybe wants to go. Yeah, what's up, man? Uh, thanks for having me up. I'll be really quick. Um, I just wanted to throw in a comment. You said something about podcasts being tedious. Um, something I started doing maybe a year ago, Spotify, I think, introduced uh, different speeds for podcasts. So I started listening to podcasts exclusively at 1.5x speed. And it, it's a little jarring at first. It'll take you a couple of podcasts to get used to it. But once you get used to the rhythm, um, it's great for just like, quickly consuming podcasts I, I don't even think about it anymore like a 30 minute podcast is is over at the blink of an eye um so i feel like i'm wasting a little i'm not wasting as much time by uh by listening at 1.5x so i just wanted to throw that tip up there for anyone who likes podcasts but you know acknowledges that they are kind of a time sink um something to keep in mind yeah it's a good point and i'm gonna ask my um handsome co-host tash to sort of help me out here a little bit because I may need to take a one or two minute break. But um, yeah, for sure. one of the things that I did um, is do the same thing for YouTube. So you can do that on YouTube. And I do think it helps a little bit. I mean, ultimately, I think the better thing to do is just to sort of screen your podcasts. Like the idea of like listening to Call Me Daddy is probably, you know, something I can avoid. Um, but like if there's a podcast on software engineering or something like that, like or crypto, for instance, like 
the better podcasts in crypto, I'm sure, are really informative and really interesting. And if you think there's one I really have to follow, just, you know, let me know. Um, and I'm sure I'll kind of come across it myself, you know. But ultimately, um, you know, so I don't think it's like a wasted medium that's to- totally worthless. I think it is a cool thing. I think this is a cool thing. I think there's a lot of ways to communicate now. Clubhouse, obviously, is very similar where you can sort of create and do something cool. But I think, you know, there's also just kind of like what what do you what's your sort of tried and true go to thing? And for me, academic journals, um, you know, have been kind of one of those. And they're slowly, you know, to some extent being replaced or supplemented by podcasts. But there's nothing like a, a well-written experiment published in a, in a prestigious academic paper. All right, Gabe. Yeah, thanks for taking the question, Enrique. So I just had a question for you on the research and technology available to modern medicine. And hopefully this is somewhat relevant with the uh, anniversary of Lou Gehrig's death yesterday. But just on uh, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis as my example, just as a layman, I mean, I'm curious from you, you know, where you think some of these neurodegenerative or, or just diseases in general that seem to be uncurable um, how would you explain that to the lay person who, you know, thinks that there's lots of technology and, and different clinical trials available readily to modern medicine? And I, I get each uh, disease is unique in, in, in its own regard, but I guess I'm just curious, you know, where some of these issues could be uh, tackled or, or like how some of these cures could be progressed. Yeah, that's an awesome question. And I, I hope I have a good answer. So I actually think I couldn't explain it to a lay person as easily as I could explain it to a laterally a talented person or knowledgeable person in a, in a different field. So a lot of people here are in software and here's what I would say. Like a lot of people would say, well, why can't I debug this, this software uh, problem I have or something like that. And um, let's say you had a compiled software and they say, okay, well I can probably disentangle this by reverse compiling it, decompiling it, and then playing with the assembler and very slowly stack tracing it to see if, okay, here's where, you know, there's a, an overflow and here's where, you know, maybe there's a security hole or whatever. And so I would say that this is like for ALS or for schizophrenia, perhaps it's like taking a, um, a decompiled, you know, some machine code decompiled, shredded in a paper shredder, sent into outer space in a hundred different, you know, directions, and then vacuuming it all up and piecing it together and then doing it. So like these problems, like complexity of the problem is, is higher than I think commonly acknowledged. So like, yeah, we have a lot of great technology for medicine, but you know, Entropy is the enemy. So like you have, um, it's easy to do for rare genetic disease. Like um, it's easier, I should say, take um, spinal muscular atrophy, which has went from a death sentence, like a literal instant death sentence. You have six months to live from birth. So really tragic, horrible, horrible disease. I like curse, curse the disease uh, every day I studied it because it was so um, cruel. And now, you know, it's it's a, a treatable disease. I'm not saying it's like a disease anybody should get or want. Um, it's still a bad diagnosis, but it's it's a very much has changed from a, on a scale of one to 10 from 10 being the most catastrophic disease imaginable. It's gone from a 10 to something less than 10 for sure, which is amazing and, a, tri- a you know, a pain to to the success and some of the things I talked about earlier about ingenuity and engineering, those are all American scientists and American companies that did that. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm going to hoard all the glory for us, but uh, the point is, uh, you know, some of these diseases aren't that simple and the amount of entropy created with the little genetic information code we have and how it sort of like rapidly unravels into this more complex system, you know, it's sort of like software. Like we have this very, very mundane, you know, engineering problem that we can make more complex. And then, you know, we have really, really not so great tools when it comes to like relative to like what a programmer has with a, with a something like a debugger. Um, There was a joke on Twitter earlier about using debug statements, like um, just simple print statements um, to a log file to say, okay, this is where, you know, the program's going left. And that's sort of something that every programmer has done from time immemorial, no matter what you're taught and how to try and catch errors and you know, stuff like that. You still... Which, by, by the way, I'm doing that right now as we, as we speak. Right. You know, you just basically have it print out some variable or have it print out some statement just to see if that function got called or not. We don't have those kinds of tools quite yet. Um, so as, as, as modern as people assume that drug discovery and, and disease management or disease diagnosis and things like that, 
like we have a mass spectrometer, which has been around for 60 years. We have liquid chromatography, which has been around for a similar amount of time. Genomics has been around actually quite a while. So we have high throughput genomics and next generation genomics, but we have had, we've been able to sort of tell nucleic acid sequences for a long time. There's a company called Applied Bio that figured that out 40 years ago. There's polymerase chain reaction that is quite old as well. I think the Nobel Prize for that was awarded in the 80s. So, you know, our tools haven't expanded as quickly as maybe we think uh, or we're led to believe. There's a lot of new tools to make drugs, which is great. And some of them like um, mRNA um, clearly saved the day with um, the vaccine for COVID. So I think probably there's a misunderstanding, one, on our tools. And then there's a misunderstanding on the degree of difficulty. Like schizophrenia is very, very interesting to me because for a while it was a big bread and butter for the pharma industry. And then there's there has not been a treatment advance in schizophrenia for around 30 or 40 years. And um, there's no good reason why. Um, it's sort of a mix of lack of trying. It's a mix of lack of creative thinking. But really, it boils down to the difficulty of the problem being like, you have this crazy entropy that has results in a weird disease state of psychosis. Um, and the same thing applies for bipolar and depression, mind you. So any psychiatric disease, you mentioned the neurodegenerative diseases, those are actually probably a bit more tractable than uh, the um, psychiatric diseases, although ALS has been quite, quite difficult. It's really unclear if ALS is a single disease. It's really unclear why some people with ALS die in six months and why some die in five years and why some don't die at all. Um, you know, it's a really, really tricky illness, um, to say the least. And people just don't know where to start. You know, um, why schizophrenia happens is probably one of the most interesting things to me because there's a meta disease there, right? You have something clearly going wrong biologically, but then the substrate is the mind, right? And you, you, you know, you have this, uh, cause and effect that's very, very tough to figure out. So at least with, with, uh, ALS, you kind of have a very, you know, kind of touchable, palpable kind of thing going wrong. Um, it's still not easy. And you've seen so many different ALS drugs not work over the last decade or two, even though there are ALSs that are caused by known genetic errors like SOD1 ALS and so forth. So it's a tough one. I think the short answer is entropy. Like there's just too much disorder and too much to disentangle that it seems like a straight shot, but it really is is not like Alzheimer's is another one where it's really unclear what, you know, what's going on in Alzheimer's at all. You know, what's going on in ALS is also unclear. So we don't really know. And one of the things we're limited by in those diseases is we can't biopsy very easily kind of what's going on in an active brain or an active nerve system. Like it's really hard to sort of, um, you know, actively like in, in programming, just like hash was doing a minute ago, I can change something, then run the code and see what happens, right? It's very hard to do that here where you can't really do this rapid compilation and trials take so long, right? Whereas in computer science, you click a button. So I think we're, we're medicine is always going to move slowly. And I think that's one of the sadder things um, that, you know, you see a lot of people talking about immortality and longevity and stuff like that. The reality is medicine is one of the slowest moving, most difficult, most regulated fields in the world. And it's really hard to, to, to sort of move the needle. Um, if your disease is like, I had a friend die of cystic fibrosis when I was 19 and now cystic fibrosis is like for most patients is almost curable, which is like incredible. Um, but unfortunately his time, it wasn't for his time. And SMA is the same people, the same thing. Tens of thousands of people died of SMA and now there's drugs. So like you're, it's sort of a lottery of like, okay, when does the drug industry and academia figure it out? When they figure it out, you might get cured. You might not. ALS is one of these things where people have died of ALS, you know, in the last six months, a year, last two, three, four years. Um, some people I know. And like, who knows, maybe Biogen or one of these other companies comes up with a monster ALS drug. And that's why I think like the pharma industry really doesn't deserve to ever be de demonized. Like I have so many great friends that have been saved by pharma. Um, you know, obviously when you see things like Purdue, when you see things like ADHD drugs, even when you see things like me, like you get a little frustrated that, okay, this is bullshit. Why, why is this happening? But in reality, I think, you know, you look at the drug industry is it's really an, as an ensemble singling out any one bad actor, or putting that aside for a second, like it's really an industry trying to do the right thing for humanity. And, you know, there, there's some people that are maybe doing the wrong thing and trying to hide it. Or maybe in my case, I would just proffer maybe I was doing the right thing and kind of went about it the wrong way. But either way, like there was a lot of, 
there's a lot of really great people in pharma that are working hard, especially in Cambridge, Mass, where you have tons of biotechs and pharmas really doing great research to save people's lives. And, you know, it's an industry I'm really proud of, but, you know, unfortunately have contributed negatively towards. So anyway, Will, do you want to jump in or hash? Go ahead. Uh, hey, Martin, I just wanted to kind of uh, jump in real quick because uh, what we were, you, you were just talking about um, ties in really well with the question I wanted to ask, which is, um, you know, this kind of whole talk we've just been having about, you know, the, the progress of medicine and the progress of technology. Um, I, I wanted to ask, do you think we might be thinking about all this in like very legacy terms? Because isn't the only real factor that matters towards any progress, uh, it, like just getting that AGI done? I know you did that predictions blog where you, um, I forget when it was exactly, but you at some point said that AGI would be created. I think it was probably within the next uh, three decades or so. But, you know, once we get that AGI, you know, after that, you know, all problems are basically going to be solved, right? Like, isn't that the mental model we should be thinking of rather than the old traditional ways of, you know, developing technology and developing medicine and treatments? You know, when, when can we get that, you know, all knowing kind of AGI to solve any kind of problem that humanity has for it? Hey, it's a crazy, it's a crazy question. And I'm, I would, open it up to the floor. I know we have a lot more questions to go and we'll get back to a Q&A model, but let's maybe try to be more uh, collaborative now. So feel free to jump in and answer. I'll give a real quick answer, which is I think partially that's probably true. But again, one of the things that's really hard about the future is predicting it. <laughs> and, you know, it's fun to to see to try to imagine what the world will be like in 2050 or 2100. But, you know, there are plenty of people that think like uh, we were talking about Penrose the other night, like there are people like Penrose that think what's going on in our minds is, is intractable to computing. And you see GPT-3 and you're like, man, we're getting close. Like these things are starting to think it's getting real close and it's real scary. And maybe at some point I can have this machine do my job for me. How great would that be? Right. Um, so I, I think that is a really good point. I don't know what the answer is. I do think AGI will do a lot of stuff, whether or not it's like the final question. I don't know. Probably is to some extent, but you know, it's one of these things like, how could anyone have conviction in that answer? I mean, you, you could imagine it, you know, you can imagine that these smart machines would, will replace the need for lots of things. And we could just focus on being happy, which has been elusive for forever. <laughs> um, and maybe it's the end of humanity. I don't know. But I do think it's fun to think about and talk about. I, and I, again, I'm really curious what other people think. Just jump in if you have an opinion on AGI. And if you don't, you know, make some emoji, I guess. Yeah, I mean, for sure. I mean, I'll just quickly um, finish those thoughts that I was uh, I was uh, bringing up earlier. And I, I do appreciate your response of like, you know, we don't really know when it, it's going to happen, like the, the so-called singularity. Um, but as you as you said, like they're, they're, they are getting really good where if you play with something like a GPT-3, I mean, personally, I, I like to say that I think that something like a GPT-3 might actually, quote unquote, feel something at this point. I don't know what it is. It's like maybe con I don't know what consciousness is, but it certainly at this point with like if you play around with it and it's like passing the Turing test is like, I mean, it, it's like aced the Turing test like a while ago Yeah, beyond that already. So uh, this stuff's just getting crazier and crazier and at a faster rate than anyone has predicted like nobody would have thought that you know the transformers and language models and stuff like that have would be this good this fast and they're only getting faster so yeah, yeah. so just to make sure everybody knows hash is talking about a program called gpt3 created by a company called open ai um and he's also talking about in general something called large uh, language model which is a new style of uh, artificial intelligence software um yeah i mean the idea that it's it's feeling something i think you're a little bit ahead of me on that one. I'm not quite ready to resign on humanity just yet, but um, it's possible. Um, I do want to do some robotics and like embed one of basically these GPT-3s in in some robotics. And I have a new model um, that might, you know, be a little different from kind of the way we look at AI and, and training right now. I think that one of the weird things that we do is like take the whole corpus of the internet and throw it at um, throw it at a, at a model. And you get something interesting, right? You get GPT-3, which seems a little bit more alive and it seems a little smarter than, than old models. Um, but I think there's more you can do. Um, I think that one of the things that we do, uh, for example, is um, we don't train these models very effectively. Like 
we just do it once and done. Whereas if you look at the little models that we train when we get, uh, when we start families and women get pregnant and, uh, or people, I should say, get pregnant because now people get pregnant, not just women. Um, you can, um, have, a, a little neural network right there and it takes a long time to train that little neural network. I think some neural networks train a little faster, some a little slower, but ine inevitably the neural network starts to talk around two years old or one and a half, starts to giggle and laugh and smile. And by two or three, it's causing all kinds of havoc. And by five or six, it can tell you all kinds of crazy things. So that neural network takes a long time. So the idea that you can just train a neural network overnight and it has feeling, I mean, that's incredible. It's possible. Maybe. Who knows? I don't know. Um, but I think like, you know, the wetware that we've got is slower, right? Uh, a neuron is like a million times slower than a transistor. So we'll see. Sorry about that. So, yeah. So anybody else want to jump in? Will, maybe? Um, hey, Martin. Are you referring to me, by the way? That's like a sort of open invitation I have as a name. It's like a meme. Anyway, um, in the previous uh, space, I noticed that uh, you mentioned the words bijective functions near the end of it. And uh, I was wondering uh, if you're interested in uh, sort of um the the bridge between math and computer science basically because there is a particular uh brand of computer science that deals uh with bridging these two and uh it's called uh, it's it's a bit tedious but it's called formal methods and basically you can define a software system uh its inputs outputs uh invariant the model and i was wondering if you are familiar with that at all and sorry for my bad accent i'm like foreign i'm, I'm from greece your neighbor country so i'm very sorry about the accent no it's fine i i'm albanian so as you know so we're yeah i know <laughs> where you could throw throw a rock and hit greece from where i'm where i'm from so yeah. <laughs> uh so lots of it's lots of great questions so i love math i studied a lot of number theory and algebraic uh abstract algebra algebraic number theory cryptography uh topology um graph theory lots of stuff like that in prison it's a good time to do math um but um i didn't get that much done as, as, as it sounds perhaps but i got a little bit done um so I think like probably the best area for me in this space is, and I'll talk about formal methods and, and stuff like that in a minute, but probably my favorite space is, is theorem proving. And so um, I'm sure it sounds like you, you got some academic background in math. Um, to me, like theorem proving was one of the first pieces of AI, actually. Um, if you read some AI history books, like this was one of the first places people pointed the AI gun towards and started firing. And there was actually a couple little successes. And then if you know enough math, you know about this four color theorem, which is really interesting. If anybody wants to Google four color theorem, it's basically this, oh gosh, it's a topology problem, I would say, but some people would say it's a group theory problem, but regardless, it's a problem in math where you basically uh, are asking how many colors do you need to color map such that they're adjacent um, uh, adjacent states, if you will, of the, on the map were- or, um, Adjacent contrast? Ad adjacent countries in the map, right, don't share the same color. So, um, and it's the four color theorem. So anyway, um, this was proven by a machine, which was kind of like the first real proof by a machine. Some people believe it doesn't, doesn't hold for that reason, because it's a very long proof that's sort of like cheating. Um, but, you know, we have a lot of proofs in math, like the Goldbach conjecture or the Riemann hypothesis or many others that are, I mean, Fermat's last theorem is, I think, still kind of, to some extent, still in that category, even though it was proven uh, by Andrew Wiles, um, you know, of proofs that, you know, if a, if a super intelligent machine could um, think about, you know, how to apply, you know, fairly elemental kind of operations, kind of the Pino operations or Pino logic um, or the ZF, was it Zermelo Frankel um, system, you know, these sort of basic math systems to, to these sort of uh, givens and sort of result in a proof. You know what could you come up with? Could you prove something is true? Could you prove something's not true? Like the continuum hypothesis, and I go on and on. I mean, there's dozens of these like important theorems, um, and heretofore there's just been this assumption that it takes some brilliant person like uh, a Gordel or like an Erdos or 
someone like that to to come up or Galois or you know whoever uh, to come up with an answer. You know, it takes some flash of genius like Ramanujan, uh, who was uh, said that he he was his a lot of his theorems were given to him by God um, to actually sort of come up with um, some of these brilliant answers. And what if a machine could do it, right? And so theorem proving is one of my favorite areas and. I like the, the, what most people say math and is, is math and computer science fused is complexity. So that's another one of my favorite areas, asking questions like does P equal NP or other important questions and like, you know, uh, just basic sort of mathematical side of computer science, the theoretical computer science. Now in formal methods, you know, it's not an area that I'm, I'm well steeped in, but there is a piece of it that I know quite a bit about, which is the Godel numbers or, the, or Godel numering. I named it my old software company Godel Systems. Um, so the idea that you could take sort of like uh, the Alonzo Church's work or, or um, you know, certainly Turing or, or Clean or people like that and Lambda Calculus and ask any question in a kind of a formal way um, with similar, similar to the Godel's um, numbering, which I don't know if you're familiar with. You basically could take a prime number and um, assign every compute computable operation to a prime number, multiply them all out and sort of get a unique, you'll get a unique, um, you know, sort of number at the end, which rep this is a very large number, but you can embody any theorem in a number. And this can be used to prove some of the incompleteness theorem where you can sort of talk about, well, is there a, uh, you know, way to um, sort of describe a system uh, outside of the system and, you know, prove things from outside the system that are in the system and, all this sort of recursive stuff that has been talked about to death. A great book about it, if, if you want to learn about it, it's called Godel Escher Bach. Um, not my favorite book, but really, really loved, beloved by everybody uh, and anybody by Douglas Hafstutter. Again, it's one of these books that's reputation is probably a little larger than its um, benefit. It's still a great book, but um, you know, it's sort of an 8 out of 10, and everybody talks about it like it's the transcendent uh, book like the Bible. But I don't know. What, you, what do you think, Will? It, it, it's... Um, it could be that it's in, the results of that book are incor incorporated in uh, uh, the field now. I, I'm not familiar with the book, but when some something that's big uh, it, that isn't that interesting, that something that, that's considered big, it's usually because it's really incorporated in other things, and people are familiar with the concepts the concepts it uh, describes. So, yeah. Uh, Thanks a lot for answering my question. And I also wanted to say that uh, you can you could listen to uh, the, the guy that made Java has an interesting uh, uh, podcast on uh, he was invited in uh, Lex Friedman and it, it was really interesting at least seeing how a person that made something that big uh, such as the, the JVM can uh, think and. You wouldn't expect, for example, that he isn't a very verbal guy, but the, the people that are advocates of Java are sort of very formal with uh, wording and naming of uh, functions and the variables. And the guy isn't himself that made it isn't very formal. So you can find, uh, by reading people through podcasts, you can find interesting information uh, that makes you get perspective on what matters basically so yeah yeah absolutely if you can shoot me a dm with the podcast i'd love to listen to it maybe yeah sure can... sure thing thanks a lot maybe we can go to 48 hey martin uh thank you for having me up um i, I kind of have a, uh, a selfish question i guess it's not as interesting as uh as everybody else's but um unfortunately my cousin is uh is going away for roughly about the same time that you were away. So um, I guess uh, just asking for any advice you have for the family, for him especially, um, just anything that you could think of that, uh, that would help pass the time and, uh, and make sure that he, uh, he continues to develop. Yeah, um, sorry to hear that, first of all. Um, I think, uh, and there, I noticed there's some lawyers in here and stuff like that. So um, I think the, the biggest thing is like just to have um, – the handful of people that you really care about that they do their best to stay in front of that person. Um, I was very, very, very lucky. I have some people here that I talk to, I wouldn't say every day, but pretty close. And that makes the time go, I think finding contrition and understanding and like all that stuff's really important too. Like I think from his perspective, 
coming to terms with what you did and what you did was wrong and kind of like accepting that. I think virtually everyone in prison did commit a crime. Now, I believe that we're doing too much time for those crimes, but I think that, you know, not many pri- people in prison are like, you know, innocent. Um, and I know that's kind of sobering to hear from like my hardcore right wing libertarian fans. Uh, it feels like it's not true. And there are definitely a lot of prosecutions that people are just getting picked on, but fairly rarely does the system get it wrong. Um, so I think, you know, getting some contrition and accepting that sort of punishment as sort of something you can grow from. Um, thankfully, your family member, I think it was, uh, or friend, didn't uh, get a um, sentence that was, you know, absurdly, absurdly long. So if I could survive it, he could survive it, or she can survive it, uh, is the first thing I'd say. The second thing I'd say is um, it's not that bad, you know, so unfortunately I had um, somebody who I mentioned uh, previously who um, committed suicide before they um, were even found guilty, let alone sentenced, and that person probably wouldn't have spent that much time in prison, so it was really, um, really unfortunate. <coughs> so the answer is it's not that bad if, if you can grow from it and if you can benefit from it, and I spent a lot of time growing, but I've met a lot of people in prison who didn't spend any time growing. They probably regressed. And it's very easy to regress if you let your mind kind of um, mess with you. I think that like there are people who spend their time in prison getting high. There are people who spend their time in prison watching TV, blaming the government. That's not the right thing to do. Now, you don't have to sit there and um, beg for forgiveness and mercy and like, you know, feel sorry for yourself every day. Um, You can look forward and not backwards. But I still think like you need support from your friends and family. Um, that's really important. And spend your time productively. Like I, I think, you know, you can definitely get something out of prison. Like you're not going away to like a lot of people say, oh, I lost four or five years of my life. That's total bullshit. Like if you want to lose four or five years of your life, you can do that in prison or not in prison. <laughs> you know, you you get four or five years of, of waking up every morning and 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 those eight hours that you spend asleep are the same eight hours everybody spends asleep. The same two or three hours you're going to spend in the bathroom or eating or whatever, those are the same or two or three hours that are going to be wasted by everybody. So the question is, what are you going to do for those kind of 12 hours where you're sentient and you don't have to do chores? And are you going to make the most of it or are you going to waste it? And I think, you know, a lot of people think of prison as, oh, man, this is lost time. But like it's, it really isn't. You get a lot of time to think about who you are, who you want to be when you come out. Um, the mistakes that you made, what might have led to them, how are you going to avoid them going forward? There's a good time for not just redemption, but just life planning and coaching in general. Um, it's going to be harder when you get out. There's no doubt about that. Your life's kind of turned upside down. But I think if you prepare and plan and learn something uh, while you're in prison, your life could actually come out um, just fine. So I, I wish your friend the best of luck. And um, I think just constantly writing, the family and friends constantly writing, sending emails, just a little email or a call here and there goes a really long way. So good luck with that. Um, maybe we go to Ozone or Aduana, I should say. Sorry. Uh, hey, man. Thanks for uh, hosting this. And also want to thank you for the YouTube videos you put out on kind of financial modeling a couple of years ago. I thought those were, I mean, just as a college student watching those and how you kind of spoke about the assumptions that go into valuing a business. I thought it was it was pretty different from what we hear from college professors and uh, pretty refreshing. Um, my question was a, you know, a broader, I guess, not to opine much on macro, but as someone who's kind of been in public markets and who's been out of it, do you, I mean, what do you think of the the broader state where we kind of had this decade of really cheap capital and a lot of uh, businesses funding growth through the income statement and now we're kind of at this what seems to be a paradigm shift with with energy driving inflation a lot higher but at the same time demographics and fertility rates being really low and that long term being the driver of a lower cost of capital um, what do you see as the kind of cost of capital and the cycle and you know, what we're seeing now in the macro world and, you know, what are your thoughts on it? Yeah, really smart questions. And I thank you for your um, positive feedback on the videos. I'll definitely be doing more of them. I think the fertility problem I'm looking to personally solve um, by myself. So you'll look out for that and hopefully I can 
um, you know, help help move the needle there. But jokes aside, I, I do think we have, um, um, you know, a, an interesting macro situation. I mean, I, I think cost of capital is like what you make of it. Like there have been plenty of great companies started in bad um, times and there have been plenty of bad companies started in good times. In fact, usually that's how it works, right? When there's too much capital, you get dynamics like board ape board ape jpeg selling for three hundred thousand dollars you get people who want to go on a five minute space ride for 25 million dollars you get i mean you see all the sort of silliness that's sort of happening um and at the peak of a cycle and now we're seeing kind of the not peak of a cycle prices are down inflation's up it looks like it's going to get worse somebody asked a question like this recently now i think this is like why like for example like the dare prim price increase not to make to talk about that but like there's a really great benefit to having a profitable company, right? Like if you look at Pfizer or Merck or Johnson and Johnson, like this is the time they lick their chops. Like this is the, this is the best time ever for them. Like we're all sitting here upset, like, Oh, my portfolio is down. What's going to happen if unemployment goes from 3.8% to 8.3%, um, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But like, if you're Microsoft or you're Oracle or you're, like this big company, or even if you're like not a big company, but just a company that's profits a lot in good times and a little in bad times, even then, as long as you don't lose money in bad times, like you love recessions because it's the time when people hunker down, they get more efficient, um, stuff like that. And you can buy your competitors, your weak competitors. And if you're a biotech company, this is the worst time for you because your stock maybe just went from a $2 billion company to a $200 million company. Not a whole lot has changed, right? Other than the cost of capital. And, um, you know, basically your stock got squashed. So you can't fight off the Pfizer because you might need another 200 million to finish your project. So it's much harder to raise that 200 million. So maybe you sell the Pfizer and we saw one company sell the Bristol Myers today. Um, and maybe have that exact discussion. Right. Um, so I think like, you know, you have to have profits like that, that as a business, that's, that's one of the most important things. So cost of capital is irrelevant if you're making profits, right? Like at the end of the day, like you can, do just fine with if you are self-sustaining business. If you need capital, then your cost of capital is relevant. If you don't need capital and you create capital, then you know you're you're happy camper. So I think like you know owning something, um, whether it's a home or whether it's you know a business that makes money or, or something, is, is sort of the desired goal because that's when this is the time when you get rich, right? Like this is the time when you know if you're Pfizer or even a mid-sized pharmaceutical company, you don't have to be giant. But right now, universities, biotech companies, they'll in, in maybe six months from now, even more, they basically will give you give away anything because they can't uh, raise money, right? Or raising money is too expensive. So this is where you get your bargains. Um, the same thing applies to individuals, right? Like if you have a portfolio that or really let's say you have a really great job and you get you make a million dollars a year, right? And your portfolio is ten million dollars. You, you know, you're sort of fine if your portfolio gets cut in half because every year you get to add a million dollars of fresh capital and assuming that 10 million that went to five will come back, which probably will, um, you kind of don't care about that short term um, uh, drop. You probably are more excited about the fact that you can throw an extra million in every year. And if you have any cash left over in your portfolio, you're really excited. So I think like the, the number one goal is to always keep some cash in your portfolio. There's people that not only are fully invested, they invest on margin. And I've learned the hard way that that's like the worst thing you can do. The best investors I know have like 30% to 50% in cash at all times because they know that, you know, especially around times like this where things almost seem like they're too good, like six months ago or a year ago, th things are almost too good. You know, they, every stock was up a lot. Crypto was going crazy. NFTs were going crazy. Like call me old fashioned, but like, I just don't think all the board apes combined are worth three billion dollars like they're just photos they're not particularly great art yes it's an interesting moment in time yes it's a sea change and a paradigm shift i'm a big fan of crypto i mean i'm not like some crypto hater but i just don't think those those files are worth what they're trading for and i'd much rather have um a like say i have 10 board apes um i'd much rather have a two or three million dollar home um and i'm not even a fan of real estate uh then i then i'd have 10, 10 um, copies of um, poorly drawn, you know, kind of pieces of artwork. Again, I don't think they're worthless. I just don't think they're worth what they're trading for. So, you know, it's a long story of just sort of saying like these cycles happen, they're normal and they sort of separate kind of, you know, 
uh, people who have planned carefully, <laughs> who have cash, who have capital, who generate more capital, and people who don't plan carefully and who have been kind of, well, you know, and again, there's nothing wrong with having a biotech company that's just in the middle of a project and then the market goes to shit. But you also have to realize as an employee or as a shareholder of that biotech company, like, yeah, it's risky business. You know, it's, there's risk implicit in, in a business that's unprofitable. And Coinbase is another good example where Coinbase, like, listen, they, you know, everyone's talking about how they're, um, they have a lot of issues that they, they fired a bunch of people, that they're um, rescinding the offers they made to people, which is kind of ridiculous. At the end of the day, they're fighting for survival. So, like, you know, they don't want to go bankrupt. So ultimately, you know, when, when, when the tide goes out and cost of capital rises dramatically and you're not very profitable, you do have to make some changes to the business. And, um, you know, that's why I think, you, again, you have to think about this stuff before it happens and assume it'll eventually happen. And it's not a lot of fun when conditions are good. You kind of want to just let it rock and keep, keep growing. But, you know, nobody wants to hear about conservatism when the market's going crazy and everybody's hiring and everybody's rich off of crazy stuff. But, you know, you don't want to be the person kind of like, you know, trying to stop the party. But I think the responsible thing to do is, is to do that. Um, Ozone, do you want to go ahead? Yeah. What's up? Uh, what's up, Mark? Um, I was just wondering if, um, you, you know, in crypto, there's always, you know, people building and, and developing protocols. But I was wondering if it was uh, just feasible to use programming not to develop, but sort of uh, game the or game the systems, uh, so to say, to, uh, you know, like maximize uh, EV uh, sort of like. Uh, have you seen the movie uh, uh, The Imitation Game with the uh, Enigma Machine? Sure. Um, sort of like that, you know, like uh, man can't be or man can't be machine, but you know, machine can be machine. Um, so, would it be feasible to uh, learn programming for the in the effort to beat the protocol? I guess or or gain it in in a, a sort of way. I'm not 100% sure what you're asking, but I think that one of the things that's coming up here is basically, you know, you're talking about sort of cryptographic protocols, their security. Is it possible to use AI or other tools to actually crack some of these protocols? Is that a fair synopsis? Well, or? well not really crack it, but uh, I kind of kind of just as from a trading point of view, uh, you know, there's like uh, there was like oh, OHM and what would it... Uh, I guess it's hard to make sense of, but um, use, well, just using your, would it be smart to learn programming to use it to, uh, I guess, get the most profitable trade? Or sure, most, uh, sure. So now I understand where you're going. So there's a great book called The Man Who Solved the Market. Um, it's by a Wall Street Journal writer. Um, his name escapes me at the moment. But the book is about Jim Simons, who's uh, a computer programmer, and he was actually a code breaker at the place before they called it the NSA. So um, he was a math professor. He's, you know, very celebrated academic. And then he, at the age of 40, decided to do a complete career change and become a trader of all things. Well, he tried to trade and it didn't work. Um, he tried to trade based on his instincts and information and things like that. And then he decided to program a computer to trade. And then the world changed. He single-handedly kind of ushered in this quantitative revolution. It probably, well, he wasn't the first guy to do it, but... He was amongst the first, and he ended up creating one of the, if not basically the most successful uh, hedge fund ever. He's the most successful investor of all time, and he's not a person that looks at balance sheets. He's not a person that looks at uh, stock charts. He's a person that programmed or helped uh, hire a team that programmed a computer to trade automatically, and he made the most amount of money in the stock market ever, more than Warren Buffett, more than George Soros, more than Steve Cohen, et cetera. Ash? I believe they're called magicians. <laughs> yeah, uh, the fund made around 80% a year for a very long time. So Simons has the, you know, arguably is was one of the richest people in the world. Um, if you sort of would securitize this company, it would be worth more than Goldman Sachs. Um, so anyway, trading with, with, with a computer is probably kind of like... Um, you know, trading without a computer is probably kind of like being in professional sports or MMA without steroids. Like, you can try it, but, you know, most, most of those guys are doing steroids for a reason. Um, and I think, you know, 
in, in this case, you actually don't have the downsides of steroids, you know, the health effects and so forth. So, you know, you kind of have to do it at this point to, to keep up with the Joneses. Like trading without computer help is almost like as crazy as like, I don't know, doing your own spell checking or, you know, whatever, like copy photocopying instead of, I don't know, pick any like archaic thing. Like, so the day of the stock picker, that's like a gumshoe. That's like looking at balance sheets and interviewing management. Like it's slowly starting to kind of go away, I think. And if you look at the most of the successful hedge funds now, they're, they're more quantitatively oriented, even if they're not completely computer decisions, you know, the computers are making more and more part of that decision. So I highly recommend that you, learn to program if you want to learn how to invest. So PF Rube, what do you got? Hey, uh, Enrique. Um, thanks for hosting. I just first want to say, I really appreciate all your music. It's, I don't know. I, I just love the reggaeton, um, you know, genre and, and what you do with the brand and oh, the not type of music is, I don't know, something, something special. So I appreciate that. I kind of want to um, move away from music and, and talk more about, uh, just crypto in general and your time uh, within prison um, or however you called it. Um, what was like the general sentiment among your fellow um, colleagues or prisoners? I don't know what the exact term is um, about crypto while you were inside. Could you feel kind of like the similar types of euphoria or depression that we could feel uh, on the outside, I guess. And, you know, any other insights that you could draw about the markets? Yeah, it's kind of interesting. Um, obviously, you know, you wouldn't normally kind of look at prisoners as the um, a pool or population that, you know, anybody's truly interested in their financial viewpoints. But, you know, you see a lot of different people in prison. I mean, it's pretty fascinating. Um, <coughs> so um, there were some interesting pieces of it. <coughs> I think a lot of people are enamored with crypto in prison. Um not probably on a different like percentage of population than, than you see out there. Um, there's a lot of interest in starting fresh after committing a crime. And I think that crypto sort of promises that from an anonymity perspective, it promises it from like kind of like a new leaf perspective. Um, you have people in crypto who are very prominent, who have been to prison. Um, so uh, there is a little bit of a counterculture slash kind of, um, I don't know, uh, irreverence that, that is in the community that's sort of a little more accepting than, than maybe a more stodgy community. You know, they're, they're sort of a rule breaker mentality. Um, so you do have a little bit of that. Having said that, you know, there is this sort of um, same skepticism that you see uh, out there where it's like, okay, do I want to replace fiat? I kind of like fiat. I'm used to $100 bills in the case of a criminal. <laughs> I'm used to a fat bank account. Um, I'm not too excited about, you know, having this crypto that's, you know, unclear to me what this is worth if anything you had some guys i, I met a guy in prison who had a bored ape um so uh he's coming out pretty soon he did a very he's doing a very quick in and out uh stay but um so you know you, you had people in prison that really understood like my buddy here was, was here earlier uh who did quite a bit of time and he was like a really really sharp he's a crypto trader like he's sharper than i am so um you know, you get all kinds of guys like he was a computer hacker um, if you were here at the very beginning of this uh, chat. So, you know, I don't think there's a lot to glean and kind of like distill and infer. But I do think, you know, it is cool to see like the unbanked. I think that's Vitaly Buterin's sort of like one of his big proposals here is that you've got a billion people that are unbanked. I'm more or less unbanked. Like it's very hard for me to keep and hold bank accounts. Um you know, so whether you're um, a former criminal or uh, somebody who um, is not liked or maybe both, you know, you're, you're going to have a hard time sort of dealing in society. And I think that one of the promises of crypto is sort of this level playing field where everybody's sort of equal on the blockchain. So I, I don't know if that helps. CF, do you want to jump in? And if you have already asked your question and you want to step down and make room for somebody else, I think that'd be great. Go ahead, CF, whenever. Or Owl. Chief Financial Autist. You're currently not audible to me, at least. Dino, do you want to jump in? Well, CF. Hey, Enrique. Um, I have a random question. I joined one of your Twitter spaces after, before your profile got deleted. 
you held a short 40 minute Twitter space responding to some criticism and on your project and you kind of clarified slightly what your project was about. Uh, I just kind of wanted to see if there were any updates on it. The things that kind of interested me from that discussion particularly that I remember, by the way, I don't have any background in like biomedical science, so I don't remember the specifics, but I remember you talking about um, kind of individuals who really care about a particular rare disease being able to create the research component necessary for them to do that and kind of creating an open market and doing that through blockchain and crypto technology. So I just kind of wanted to see if there was any update on that and how things are going with that. Yeah, I know we have at least one expert in here, um, Mr. Eigenspace, who knows a lot about um, this stuff and probably a couple more people. So yeah, I mean, uh, some people design drugs using computers and that's currently rather expensive uh, and difficult. And I think I'd like to release some software that changes that. Um, That's basically the upshot. Um, I do think that the hardest part about that is once you do all the software stuff correctly, which I don't think is that hard, the hardest part of that, uh, like kind of like designing the front end and, you know, making an experiment, a virtual experiment kind of simple, by far the hardest part that comes next is the compute costs. So you need um, really powerful computers and a lot of electricity. And that is not something everybody has. In fact, that's something basically nobody has. Um, You need uh, Amazon Web Services. You need um, a supercomputer. You need something um, that that it's hard to do with your phone or your desktop. Um, Nevertheless, some people try and do it with their desktop. So you can probably screen, I don't know, 10,000, 20,000 compounds a day on a a modern desktop. So if you had 100, um, that'd be nice. And you can rent 100 computers on Amazon pretty easily. Um, it'd be even nicer if you could um, do a billion compounds. Um, then you would need 100,000 computers, which is not so affordable or easy. So anyway, the point is that let's say you had a really good idea on how to cure or treat, I should use the treat word, treat Alzheimer's disease by blocking a protein called CXCR3. This is not a new idea. Some people think CXCR3, by blocking that specific protein, you may treat Alzheimer's disease. Do I know? No, I don't. It seems like a reasonable idea. Is it going to work for sure? No, I really don't know. It probably won't work, in fact. So the point is, you don't know how to block CXCR3. Now, there's traditional ways you could do this with test tubes and beakers and wet labs and all the equipment that comes with, you know, that and pipettes and chemical libraries and doing a high so-called high-throughput screen. That's traditional pharmaceutical stuff. But you could also do an in silico screen or a virtual screen, and that's something that I've done. I've sort of done both sides of this. Um, And a virtual screen basically takes a whole bunch of molecules um, from a file and designs a sort of 3D space and um, just basically measures how each one of those molecules changes the total free energy of that sort of complex. The lower the free energy, the better. Um, The the universe likes the lowest amount of energy state. Um, And so you look and sift and score every single one of those molecules until you find the one with the lowest state or maybe the top 100 or the top 500 or whatever. And you have clues now for what could be drugs, what could be blockers of that protein, in this case, CXC, CXCR3 for um, Alzheimer's disease. Maybe you think a different protein will cure Alzheimer's disease. In other words, blocking that protein. Almost every drug that we have is a blocker of a protein. So that's sort of the theme here. So finding a blocker for a protein and hoping that when you put that into a human that will work. Of course, you still need to put it in an animal. You still need to put it in different cells in vitro, as they say. Um, you have to do toxicology, very inhumane process in vivo, usually in two different species, such as rats or, or dogs, but at least two species. So ultimately very tragic sort of experiment that you have to do and euthanize those animals and determine whether your drug was toxic or not. So again, tons of things you have to do after the in silico part. But let's say you decided that that was the experiment you wanted to do, but you don't have a billion computer, you know, do a billion compute cycles. You need to buy them and they're really expensive. Well, you could put your project up on our platform. And again, we haven't announced it yet, so we still have a ways to go. You sort of asking me to prematurely announce it, which I don't want to do. But basically, it'd be nice if there was a platform that allowed you to sort of distribute that pro- problem across a huge network of computers and people could contribute their um, compute cycles whether they want to do that for free or not, I don't know. They might want to charge you. Um, but if you put up your project and said, listen, join my Alzheimer's research project, 
I'm willing, you know, I'm, I don't have any money. All I, I'm relying on your sort of uh, generosity to com- contribute your compute cycles. Just put it on your screensaver. If enough people do that, you will get your billion compound screens. So now if you're a big company, you may use my software to um, basically just say, you know, I want to screen a billion compounds. And oh, by the way, I have a million dollars. So if you do do my job, I will pay you in Solana or in Ether or, or in whatever the case may be. So, you know, it's traditionally how companies do it now. It's a very sort of gatekept um, field where academics and even big pharma have a tough time using the software. It's very kind of technical and difficult to use. And especially the compute part of it is actually still rather um, a bit of an unsolved problem. So anyway, look out for that. But that's kind of something I've been working on for a long time and excited to finally release it at some point soon. Uh, Victor, do you want to jump in? Hey, Enrique. Uh, good to talk to a fellow Albanian that is a reggaeton superstar. So Yes. There are not many Albanians in reggaeton. I know, right? So it's a nice niche market. <laughs> um, <laughs> so uh, my question is more, when you're talking about consumption and like Netflix and all this stuff and a lot of stuff being a waste of time, how do you approach, you know, I've been following, I forgot who it was talking about your finance courses. I, I think ever since then, following a bunch of stuff you put out there, how do you go about like learning a new industry, new field? How do you approach it? I'm just curious about your take on learning and how you approach uh, looking for paper, new protocols, and Web3, all, all of this. Yeah. Um, there's a great book uh, by Josh Waitzkin called The Art of Learning, and he was a chess master who became a Tai Chi champion. So he went from a very boring kind of game called chess to a very exciting and difficult martial art um, called Push Hands, which is very, very competitive and very dangerous it's not the tai chi you see in the park and so how do you do that right how do you go from a child chess prodigy he's the um he's the uh inspiration for the film searching for bobby fisher which was a big hollywood movie a lot of people have seen and so how do you go from doing that to that i don't know i'm no josh waits again um and uh i know bobby fisher <laughs> um and um, certainly no uh martial artist so i i think that the answer is, I think you have to, like, the long answer is you just have to have a lot of, like, joie de vivre and love uh, for knowledge. And, like, you, you really have to have a ton of energy um, for learning things. And you have to sort of cultivate that, you know, aha and eureka moments. Like, those are the most exciting things to you. They're more exciting than an orgasm. They're more exciting than the sun hitting your face on a beach. Uh, uh, that those are really what you care about and love. And some people just aren't built for that. You know, some people don't care about that. Uh, I, I, and I hope that most people aren't built like that. For me, that's more exciting to me than any of the things I mentioned. And, you know, that's what I love. Um, so learning requires that, you know, because if you don't really love kind of the process of learning and the tedious parts of it, which are like, like I just downloaded some book that's like 1500 pages and I'm like, oh, Jesus Christ, do I really want to read this? It looks like a mess. Um, but yeah, you know, I kind of do. And I, I want to almost challenge myself to see, like, you know, can I can I do it? Um, and, you know, the answer is I really can't, you know, between all the things I have to do and all the places I got to be and, and you know, all that, I'm going to fail at that goal. But, you know, how much of it can I accomplish? You know, what can I glean from it? You know, all those things are important questions because I meet people like my partner on um, the computational chemistry side who humbles me with his brilliance and, um, people in business and other people like that, that I want to sort of be, be like, and if you hold your hand standards high um, that you want to impress uh, and be on those people's level. Um, and some of the people aren't that well known, like, you know, I've unfortunately become a household name, but the guy in my project hasn't. And I think he'd probably prefer it that way. But the point is he's, he's a ton more, more intelligent than I am. And, you know, I just want to be able to sort of even keep up with him and, if you have that motivation and that competitiveness, I think you will, you will learn, you know, is there a specific process to learning a specific thing? No, obviously there's, you know, if you're learning technology, you have to mix obviously your theoretical knowledge with actually putting your hands on software. It's really hard to learn software from a book. (laughs) Um, The same thing applies in business. You can read all the business stuff you want and go get all the MBA um, degrees you want and so forth. But you actually have to do business. Sometimes trading works the same way. Investing works the same way. Um, you know, you have to have a mix of actual practice. I think law works the same way. You know, if you, you know, for example, my lawyer or one of my lawyers, uh, who is my criminal attorney is a fantastic criminal attorney. He's a brilliant, brilliant guy. There's nothing that like 
you know, intelligence wise, you can put past him. But his real brilliance is his practitioner, uh, practitioner nature, right? He actually goes in courtrooms and gets people acquitted. You know, that's hard. <laughs> that's really, really hard to do. You know, most of the people who, uh, when I asked him, like, why, why should uh, I work with you? His simple answer was, I've actually gone in a courtroom and come out with my client after hearing the words not guilty. And almost every lawyer you're interviewing right now has never done that. And I was like, yeah, you know what? You're hired. <laughs> and he got me not guilty on five out of eight of my charges, which is also a pretty, pretty good accomplishment. So the point is, like, you know, you got to mix, you know, kind of theory with practice. You have to, you know, put in more hours of work that are attentive, productive hours than anybody else. Carl Malone had a very uh, poignant kind of um, perspective on that, that he was upset when he wasn't at the gym because he knew somebody else was at the gym and whoever else was at the gym while he was not at the gym was getting stronger and bigger and becoming a better basketball player. And like, you have to be that competitive, you know, and, and love it um, to, to really get somewhere. And those are a couple of thoughts I have. I don't know if that helps, but I'm going to just do a couple more minutes. Maybe X Tanger wants to jump in. Hey Martin, how are you? Hey. Um, you know what? I have a personal thing to say first. Thanks to you. I've gotten hooked onto uh, Twitter spaces. I don't know if that means anything. Probably not. No, but, that's great. Happy yeah, it, um, the second thing is, um, this is something for you. There's a company in Toronto called Cohere, C-O-H-E-R-E, so natural language processing. Are you familiar with them? Yeah, I've heard of them. I, I, I you know, just people. Do some digging. Me. Do some digging. These guys, I know the guys personally. They're friends of mine. Wicked smart. They're Wicked in LL, smart. They're like in LLM, right? They're competing a little bit with OpenAI. They're ahead. Yeah, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> They're ahead. So I figured you'd probably enjoy that because I find you as, um, and I hope you take this in the most loving way, you have a devious, brilliant mind, which I think is required when you're in business. Um, no, I, I appreciate it. Seriously. A um, couple things. You know, you kind of remind me of culturally in a different time, um, Michael Milken. You know, and he reinvented himself and he created the Milken Institute and the Milken Conference. You know what? I really, truly believe you in a very different way could, in fact, have a very different group of people that are attending on topics that are probably way more relevant or, let's say, below the below the line uh, where Michael is, you know, with the politics and all that. So um, um, I really encourage you to think about that. Uh, yeah. because I, think, I think there's a lot of people that are in this space who are asking questions. We're not judging. We're like brilliant people that have figured something out. Obviously, they've gotten their head uh, financially. Maybe legally they've made some mistakes. But I mean, for God's sakes, um, thank God we live in a society where we can come back. Um, the real question that I want to ask you is, I believe we're in a moment right now when it comes to talent and attracting talent is never been easier, but at the same time, more difficult in terms of figuring people who have that kind of attitude, that curiosity, that, you know, voracious appetite. And at the same time, just kind of like a humble approach, you know, and, and wanting to be surrounded by, you know, other smarter people. And um, how do you do it? Because I'm thinking that Y Combinator came and gone. MIT Labs kind of sort of still there. And there's, I know Launch House is in New York and LA, um, Mark Andreessen um, has invested in them. And I think there's another spot there for crypto to like basically create a hacker house that's almost like an invite only thing. And in a strange intuitive way, I have a sense that how would you approach that? And would you want to be a part of it? Yeah. So first of all, thank you very much. Um, Milken is high praise. Um, I do think that a little bit of uh, what he's done with his institute and so forth has been partially image repair, um, partially kind of, um, again, I'm not going to take anything away from the guy, but he successfully got a U.S. pardon, so he's no longer technically a felon, which is, you know, a big accomplishment for him. Um, I, I, in terms of, like, talent and stuff like that, I, I think that, you know, it's, 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 it's really corny, but, like, the little software team that I've assembled is, like, the group of the, the best, like, we're all going to a wedding. Like, we haven't been at the company for four years. And every single one of us is going to a wedding in a couple of weeks um, or about a month. And um, it's because like we all truly have this like profound love for each other. And 
it's really like it's the strangest thing in the world like any company i've ever worked at i don't talk to anybody basically anymore like especially three or four companies ago and all these guys we have this like crazy bond um that's like unbreakable and it's it's just so weird and i think a big part of it is like as a manager you just have to start to like break this this mold that you're i mean other managers do this but you really have to break down that that barrier of like i'm the boss and you're not and i think mm -hmm. that's the first thing that has to go in every organization and i think what you know this you know gabe at valve and like their whole like the way they work at all I don't, I don't know who you're referring to. Okay, so Valve is a computer video game software company that is not only makes video games, but they also have the most successful platform for uh, video games called Steam. Um, and Steam is just sort of a, a, a toll taker. They're sort of like an app store for video games. They're a multi-billion dollar company. They've done very well. Gabe's like this very like <laughs> um, humble hacker that just like, they're all on these like... Um, mobile desks your desk moves with you so you can mm -hmm. go around your desk and like just decide where you want to sit on any given day and gabe responds to emails he's on message boards he's like still the average joe and i think like managers like that can build a culture of of you know a place where people actually love to work which is really hard to do um because nobody loves to work anywhere i mean a lot of people are machiavellian they want to work a few a few years at a place for the quote unquote for the resume and then jump from a Google or an mm -hmm. Apple to do their own thing or whatever. And you really don't want people like that, even if they're good, um, because you want the person that like doesn't have that, like, I guess, prescribed, prescribed like career arc in mind. They are, if you can make them happy, they're going to stick with it. <laughs> if, if you can make them happy is different from can pay them the most. Right. And make them happy is different from, you know, solve every problem they have. I think, you know, creating a work family that like people really like is, is difficult. And I think other people have tried it and, you know, failed. I think this was the one time in my life after starting a lot of companies, uh, I tried it and it worked and it didn't work perfectly. You know, there's like one person we don't talk to and stuff like that, but like, you know, it generally worked and I want to keep sort of trying to lead like that. It's one of the hardest things managers have to do. And, and management, you know, there's tons of books about management. Um, there's tons of books about DevOps and management. And, you know, I, I think I think the secret for me, one of the secrets has been to, to try to learn what the your coworkers are learning and respect them on a level that is more than just like, oh, I'm a big shot. Like Mark Andreessen is interesting because like he, he was mm -hmm. a real software guy. He has the bona fides, but like I don't know to to what extent he still does or doesn't. And again, I'm, you know, I res respect him tremendously and look up to him. But you know, I think once you start move floating from being kind of like a practitioner to being a quote unquote manager, I think you start to lose that connection that can allow for that mutual respect and that that again, for so, lack of a better term, love. So I'm wondering, I'm wondering if you might be able to do me a favor if you. If you have like a short list of people that you consider like these are amazing people in crypto to follow, because I see that with crypto Twitter, it's kind of missing. It's all over the place. But one last thought, right? With the billions of dollars, that four and a half billion dollar fund that Andreessen Horowitz has, and then there's like Paradigm Unchained, all these guys are in the place. There's a there's a lot of dry powder that's out there that are looking and hunting for some amazing projects. And my sense is, my sense is that there is no one here who's actually organizing the best of the best out there. In other words, not some Russian team that's just rinsing and repeating and pumping and dumping, but something that maybe is US based that involves some, I'm Canadian, so, um, but I'm now living like in the Caribbean, you, maybe the moonlight is hitting me, so I'm enjoying the waves here, listening to you. But um, you hear where I'm going with this? It's kind of like, it's, it's this really beautiful moment of gathering some talent and understanding that there's a lot of possibilities. And I agree with you in terms of the crypto thing. It's more than just the JPEGs. And I'm wondering who's out there that's thinking in terms of that paradigm shift, that Z-axis movement, and where are those developers and are they gathering and who's organizing them? And that's why I brought up the whole Michael Milken thing. I, I really do believe there's a, a chance here to sort of like create another container to get everybody around. Um, I appreciate all your thoughts. Yeah, no, this is a great question. I mean, I, I think that you have a lot of competing problems, right? So you have those billions of dollars stashed aside, ready to deploy. And then you have people like you, you would be shocked at the amount of people um, I've talked to just in the last 
few weeks. I've been out of prison, not two weeks. And just the, the crazy amount of people who said, I watched your videos, I grew up in your videos, and now I'm the CEO of this little company and we raised 5 million or 10 million or whatever. Sure. And, yeah, there you go. And even, even a dude who has one of the biggest software companies in the world now, uh, one of the biggest private software companies in the world now said the same thing to me. So all the way from smaller ones to bigger ones. And I'm, I'm really flattered, obviously. Um, but at the same time, like those guys have the same job and the problem is they're mercenaries, um, which I don't fault them. Cause I, I did that too. I publicly traded company that, you know, I wanted to bring the best people in and incentivize them and grow them. And, you know, some of them stopped over for a quick ride. Some of them were more permanent. And, you know, how do you find like a real company or build a real company or a real team that, that grows forever? I think that's what Microsoft did, to be honest. I think that's what some of these companies, they don't do it perfectly, but I think the early story of Microsoft and the early story of, of Google, like that's what happens when you can actually do that. Like that's the kind of company you build, a once in a generation type of company, when you can really get people to, to buy in on the CEO. I know that Steve Ballmer and Bill Gates personally interviewed, um, not Steve Ballmer, but at least Bill Gates personally interviewed the first 100 or 200 people at Microsoft. And I think like that kind of like personal touch where like, you know, as a CEO, like what you do on a daily basis is basically irrelevant. It's what the 200 people do. And if you can personally involve yourself in their lives, like personally really understand who they are and what gets them going and, and make sure that you're doing what it takes to make their lives better and make and therefore make your products better. That's like ultimately your job. And I think so much of like the ego that's driven from like having this big valuation and having this big, you know, um, stock option plan and all that bullshit is kind of like it'll work until it doesn't. And the market goes down and your valuation's half what it was. Nobody's happy in your office anymore because you only hired these people that like what makes them happy is big numbers. Your company's going to basically go bankrupt or fall apart because, you know, if that's all they cared for, then you're not going to get there. Like, again, and it's sometimes stupid things. It's not perks like, oh, we have free McDonald's or free um, candy bars or free whatever it is that gets the staff going. Um, I don't know what they do at Google. You have free um, avocado uh, lattes or whatever, the, you know, they, they drink out in California. But, you know, the point is, like, you know, those things also don't work. Like, I used to try that. Like, perks, you know, are, are superficial. Like, what people really want is, is, like, an actual connection and an actual, like, growth and in multiple different dimensions and thoughtfulness. Like, I remember when one of my um, newly hired colleagues, um, her husband was diagnosed with cancer and I dropped everything to try to figure out a way to help, um, you know, um, money, resources, connections, anything like, and that became my most important job that day. And for a while, because ultimately, you know, that's what family is all about. And if you can get people to be interested in like working here, because this is the kind of place that that'll do something like that. That's, that's kind of like a different, mentality because like you know we, we all have to sort of think about what's important in our own lives and you know if if you know something as impersonal as like you have a ten thousand person employee company ten thousand people you're gonna end up having like somebody die on the job or like something like that you know and like how does an organization react to something like that like you know that's like you know oh you know we had somebody pass away or we had you know some other really like big event like a, a, a catastrophe a national catastrophe or something like that. Like that's, I think where companies and their culture really change. And it's, it's very hard to build a culture. It's easy to build a company, um, it, you know, but it's, it's really, really difficult. I think to build a company that'll last through ups and downs. And it's not just built to sell real quick or like achieve profitability, like really building a place that can survive you and survive the test of time. That's like the hardest thing in the world. And I think, you know, that's nir Nirvana that, you know, uh, ideally, you know, uh, you know, one can achieve, but, you know, very, very difficult. Anyway, I think I should probably call it a night. Um, you all have been waiting patiently. I'm really sorry. I, I could probably speak for forever here, but I have to go handle some small affairs and I'll make sure I'll do it again, maybe tomorrow or whenever. So thank you very, very much for your time and I'll see you guys later.